Yeah, this is the Sid Peru story. Uh, it's not because he's died or anything, unfortunately, but he's actually going to retire eventually. Well, he might, re he might retire. Well, then again, you know, if you get a phone call from Thailand, just ignore it. Um, I was working at Ealing Film Studios and um, I used to go off caving at weekends from time to time and I'd actually travel up on the Friday night um, on the train straight from work, um, cave all day Saturday, um, drink most of the night Saturday night, then cave all day Sunday and then go back on the train overnight straight back into work again so apart from being shattered I was still covered in mud and mud in my hair and everything and I'd turn up to work like this so I knew I went caving and they wanted to do a caving film um, and originally it started out as an outside broadcast which proved impossible um, and then it finished up that they decided to do a film about cave rescue they sent me up just an assistant sound we call this to advise really and um, the, the, the cameraman was a little tubby Scottish guy called Hamish and basically I mean the equipment was a disaster um, the battery pack around his waist started exploding everything went wrong and they turned to me and said look Sid you know we've obviously got problems you seem to know what you're doing any chance of you coming up and um, filming the underground stuff on the re on a rescue for us. The film that follows is about a real cave rescue call out. All the scenes of rescue work below ground were shot during the actual operation and will be shown exactly as they happened. Some of the scenes on the surface were taken on other days. It runs 500 yards to reach a 55-foot pitch, winding and twisting all the way. In places, a bit of a squeeze, but nothing one would think to worry about. Near the end are three minor pitches, 6 to 12 feet high, the first a mere scramble. And cavers make this easy journey only for the challenge of tackling the big 55-foot pitch. It leads nowhere except to the dead ends, which are the normal goal of most caving trips. At the bottom is merely a small chamber with a few blind passages. It is a climb done for its own sake. Tricky at the narrow top because the ladder has to lie against the rock overhang. Eric Luckhurst, a big young man of 19, making his first ever descent, got down safely but no doubt with much greater difficulty and exertion than the climber in the picture. People below cannot be seen from the top because of the overhang, nor could they be heard that day because of the noise of the waterfall. The signal that Eric Luckhurst was returning was to be three tugs on the lifeline. He started back up the ladder. At 2.45 p.m. he fell. The stretcher is guided from above, and also by a man below it on the ladder. Ready? Uh, in answer to your request, we now estimate that it will be two hours before we get this uh, boy out of the hole. But it was too late for any doctor. 
Eric Lockhurst was dead. The time was 9.50. We got him up to top this pitch. The 50 foot pitch. Yeah, the foot where he'd fallen. And he didn't seem so bad at all. He was, no. you know, he was quite uh, reasonable. Healthy, wasn't he? yeah, yeah. And um, I think everybody thought, oh, it was a fairly easy job getting him out. He was uh, talking to us, he was aware of what was going on. And um, everybody yeah. thought just a couple of broken ribs, a couple of hours getting out. You know, yeah. Yeah. And, much to my parents' consternation, you know, having me already had one career where I've thrown away, um, I suddenly left the BBC and went to stay in our caving hut in Halton. And um, tried to, I went, I went sign on the door and said, what do you want to do? And I, I said, well, I want to make films. Oh, we don't have any of that around here. Um, I kept on and eventually got one or two little bits of sound work and then I eventually got a commission um, from the world about us to do The Lost River of Gaping Gill. And that's where the whole thing started and where I gained a lot of experience because it took me over a year. Um, and it was a learning curve, you know, and, um, but I tried to film in the sort of places even then that nobody in their mind would. <laughs> I was just a, an 18 year old schoolboy when uh, I first heard of Sid Peru. And and it was round at Harry Long's house. Um, Mike Woodin and Tom Brown were involved in trying to link Gaping Gill and Ingleborough Cave. And Harry Long said, well, Sid's going to film the whole thing. And as a youngster, yeah, that's an ideal thing to get involved with. Find a meaning for life, finally. One thing that really impressed me right from the start was this bloke's got an incredible vision to even think of filming, you know, underground Yorkshire. Um, and going to the, you know, the limits of uh, the known caves with all this photographic gear and it, it was just a vision because I don't, I don't think even Sid really knew how it would all come together it was just that Cave has jumped on the bandwagon with him and helped him out and, and sorted things out and, it, and amazingly you know it all came together. High up on the Pennine Hills of northwest Yorkshire a river Fell Beck begins to carve its way between the limestone folds Almost before it's begun its journey, it becomes lost. The water spills down a hole, gaping gill. What happens to it? No one knows. It took four hours to travel through to the end of Whitson series and the caving task was Herculean. It was rated in caving terms as super severe. Only an expert could hope to get through. Perhaps it was the contrast from the liquid mud they'd just been through which made the white stalactite seem so delicate, and as the caver spoke, it vibrated. The passage itself was probably one of the earliest in the system, now blocked in mud and with these stalactite formations as the caver's only reward. They enlarged it enough to squeeze their bodies through and they were into a new passage. A completely new network led directly towards Ingleborough Cave, 
they had crawled a mile of the most difficult conditions of caving known in Britain and had closed the gap to a few hundred feet. The sense of isolation and claustrophobia here, cavers say, is almost unbearable. The month is April 1937 and into the world is born a child, Sidney Allen Bruce Peru. His father was another Sid and his mother was Harriet Hannah, but she didn't like that and liked to be known as Kit. Wanted to do something more interesting and first of all finish up trying to go around the world on a push bike which lasted about a fortnight and uh, came back and then got called in to do national service in the RAF and was supposedly the about the worst med assistant in the country. Sid met his first wife Alison during the planning of the Gaping Hill film in 1969. She thought he was a famous director and the battered mini moat was clearly his second car. How wrong she was. They were married on the 27th of March 1971 and went on to have two boys. Martin, the elder, was born in August 1985 and Tom two years later. Tragically, Alison, after a short illness, died in January 1996 at the age of 47. Martin was 10 and Tom was 8. You know, you get to know Sid and you sort of, uh, all the, the idiosyncrasies of Sid filming with Sid. And of course, the, we started off where, with a film that was going to take, it's going to only take about 12 weeks, lads, you know, and, and, and the pay is 10 quid each, you know. And of course, it finished up, it lasted 26 weeks every weekend down Simpsons. Um, and in the course of this, with some sort of all sorts of events that happened which involved Sid. The first, probably the, the earliest ones were when he, um, we arrived on the scene, we were down in the cave, we'd, we'd done a, a couple, two or three weeks filming and we started shooting this particular day and within about 30 seconds the lights went flat. So it's Sid, you know, what's going on? Oh well, I've been that busy this week, you know, and I forgot to, I forgot to recharge them and all this business, so that wrote that off. Anyway, it happened again the following week. So that's a really the first event. And not long after that, we were somewhat further down the hall and uh, we got to the sort of stage when, to change film in those days, it was a wind-up camera. So we had a whole checklist, Sid, take the lens cover off. Sid, have you wound it up? Sid, have you got a film in? And, and these were all events that Sid had actually caused himself. So we had this big checklist. Anyway, we got to Stone Pot and we just shot a roll of film, which was about, I think, 200 feet or so. So it's lights out, lads, I'm changing the film. So, of course, it's total darkness. Sid stat, sat or straddled in the rift above Stone Pot near the duck. And, of course, you could hear him sort of busily changing the film and then, oh, 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 oh splash. And, of course, Sid dropped. The, you, know, you can imagine what Sid, you tell us you haven't just dropped the film that we've shot. It's the new roll. Oh, no, I'm sorry, lads, we'll have to go back and shoot. So we had to get all the way back out to the sort of series of shots that we'd done leading up to that spot. And so it went on. But once the caver's eyes get used to the darkness, he can make out a narrow tunnel leading northeast from the entrance and keeping just below the surface of the moor for the first 30 yards or so. <laughs> Leslie doesn't like the cold and wet and she doesn't like the dark but she suffers it and even appears to enjoy it, just as they all do. It's hard for a non-caver to understand why, though, when you hear John Russell describing what it feels like. It, it's bloody cold when you go in water for the first time in a wetsuit. All the little tears that the cave grinds into the rubber leak. And the water shoots in in some very nasty places. So one... So one, one morning, of course, it was meeting Bernie's on a Saturday morning. It was when Bernard Robertshaw had the cafe and Alice in the early days. This was sort of 1970. And, of course, Sid arrives and, and, he, and he's a bit quiet. And John Russell said to me, there's something not right. I said, why? He's un, he hadn't bounced in in the usual way. Now then, lads, are you up for it? He said, there's something not right. So eventually he got himself his breakfast and he came over. And, and so I said, well, what's the matter, Sid? Well, lads... I'm sorry about all that stuff we shot last week. It's 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 knackered. He said it's faulty film stock. 
So I said, it's been quiet, you see. And, and then I said, hang on a minute, we shot two rolls last week, two rolls of film. Yes, well, well, there was a scratch down it. What? Down both rolls of film, said. Uh, and he started to go quiet then, and he realised what the implications of this was. The chances of two rolls of film stock with a, with a scratch down in the same place, <laughs> pretty remote. So John Russell said, Sid, fetch your fucking camera in here, you see. So Sid left his breakfast and trotted off outside and came back in. And so somebody said, uh, Bernie, can we, can we borrow a, tea, a clean tea towel off you, see? So we got this clean tea towel and laid it out on the top of the table. Give us a bloody camera here, said, you see. So this camera, of course, was shit up on the outside. And so we suspected what the problem was inside. So we took the cover off and gave it a good shake and all sorts of little bits of grit fell out. And basically that was Sid. You know, it was just a piece of grit somewhere in the gate and it had scratched both rolls of film. I wanted to do, to do some filming abroad and I was impressed by the Pierce and Martin. I always um, thought that the story of the death of Lubens and everything else was such a dramatic story. And um, I also happened to mention that had we, could we get deeper in, in the Puypalm M, which was the series of shafts just explored right at the bottom beyond the Salverna, then we, we heard that the, it ended in a bit that was too tight. And English being English decided that what was too tight for the French might not be too tight for English, you know? So we went down there and um, it was too tight, <laughs> basically. But at the BBC, I'd made the mistake of saying, look, if we can push that, we we get a world depth record. And the problem was, all that's all they heard. And the whole thing was sold on the idea of a world depth record. And of course, the world depth record didn't happen. And I made the mistake of telling them. So he, he finally got out there with a team. But we'd already been out, I think, about a week when he arrived. And um, and we made this film with the Pierre Saint Martin. At, at first, the the BBC didn't seem to like it, and said, "Oh, you know, um, forget it, Sid." So we sent all these men home, and then they got the rushes, and they said, "Oh, this is the best cave-in film we've seen. Get the men back." So we had to call the men back. I think by that time they were in England. And they had to shoot off back, and by, of course, by this time the expedition finished. Anyway, finally completed the film, and we we got back to the UK. Then I got a, a call from Sid, and uh, it could have been Sid or the BBC saying, um, uh, "We've got a slight problem." And I says, uh, "What? What's that? You know, what's the problem?" Well, the story goes that Lepinau was sat on a rock, and he was throwing stones. And a crow flew away, and he thought, ah, um, crows only nest over a big drop, so there must be a shaft there. So, of course, Lepinu had gone along and found the entrance to the Pierre St. Martin, Lepinu shaft. Um, so he says, we haven't got this on film. So he says, uh, the BBC producer says, can you find us uh, a shaft a bit like the Lepinu shaft, and I says, well, not in Derbyshire, no. <laughs> so he says, well, you must be able to find something that's similar. And I thought, well, I mean, a shaker will do, because it doesn't really matter, you know, because it was just a guy sat on a rock throwing stones. We got there, and uh, the producer opens the back of his car, and uh, he's got two sacks in the back of his car with something wriggling inside them. So I says, uh, what have you got in the sacks? And he says, crows. I said, crows? <laughs> Where the hell did you get crows from? And he says, oh, I went up to Chatsworth Estates and the gamekeeper caught me two sackfuls of crows. So he had about 20 crows in the back of his car. So I sat on this rock and uh, Sid got down in the hole with a sack of crows. So he was wearing a helmet, you know, so I threw a stone, hit him on the top of the head and he, he opened the sack and let a crow out. I did another one. Stone, bang, on the top of Sid's head. Let another crow go. This one kind of crawled across the grass and then died. <laughs> Cut, let's try again. <laughs> By this time, Sid's doing his usual laugh, you know, like he does. I can't do it. But anyway, he, uh, 
finally we, we actually got we managed to get a crow that actually flew out of the hole and he got this this shot now this this bit of a shot must have cost thousands for what two seconds three seconds where <laughs> said had done the whole film virtually for next to nothing then on the very last evening of the 1950 expedition two of the explorers were dangling their legs over some minor pothole and idly throwing stones into the shaft A crow, a pair of crows, nesting perhaps. They always nested above a deep hole. It was, when they measured it, 1,130 feet deep. Next day, they sent a telegram to their friends. Have discovered the deepest vertical hole yet known. you sense a cave you don't just see it from one view and it's something that's completely about you and and surrounding you and you gain an impression of it by moving through it and gradually get a three-dimensional feel of it they call this the meanders as tight and difficult a passage as you can find more a vertical slit than the passage, with the fear that if you fall, you might become wedged. Imagination must be kept under tight control. Fear in a place like this could be fatal. And surely a cave represents all the basic fears of man, the fear of height and of water and of the dark, and above all, the fear of being trapped. We want to go to Norway and climb a thing called the Troll Wall. It's a mile high face. And I said, um, uh, hang on, uh, I'm not a climber, you know. You know, I can climb, well, you can climb ropes. You know, we'll fix ropes for you, that's all right. So I finished up eventually getting the money together. We, we, we faced with climbing five days, we were, on the Troll Wall, sleeping on little ledges and, and one thing and another. They decided to stay put and excavate the ledge while the lead climbers found the route and roped it for the support party so that things could go faster. Dossieth and Brooks set off to climb and rope another three complete pitches. The single-decker bus we've been talking about is the largest speck of white in the middle of your screen. So, have you had a forecast down there? We've had a bit of rain today, um, earlier on. We're just drying out now. There's still a lot of low cloud about and... Uh... Still looks a bit unsettled. Have you heard anything over? It rained for a short time this afternoon, but it's stirred up down here, and apparently um, it's supposed to be dry until Saturday. Over. Till Saturday. Oh, so that gives us quite a few days to get up then. All right, thanks. Caleb, is this your last transmission for tonight? Over. Yeah, it probably is. I think so. I think we'll be turning in shortly because we want an early day in the morning. Over. Okay, then, love, now take care of yourself and don't you wonder about with no rope on like Sid and have a good night. But it was cameraman Peru's worst moment. Although he didn't know it until the film was processed, he had picked up a shred of lichen in the camera gate and he was exhausted. He had spent all day hung out on slings with often the whole weight of the camera, 15 pounds of it, directly on his eye. It seemed to the follow-up party the day would never end. Nobody filmed the filmmaker. 17 hours after recording the departure from the terraces, Peru climbed this pitch, not on the rock itself, but on a rope, swinging free from the rock, dangling out over open space. As he went, he discovered the rope was knotted in two places. He was too tired to care. It was a funny place for Peru to be. His sport is caving. While he fumbled for a while, Peru was shown the rope to which he had trusted his life the night before. The outer casing, and two of the inner cores had frayed away completely. Three men had come up by this rope with no other protection whatsoever. The crews on board, final checks are being completed. 
but because of the third and unaccustomed member of the crew, there will be one additional pressure on pilot Ian McDonnell as he tries to skim over difficult country in unpredictable mountain winds. One of the two cameras recording the flight will be as much at the mercy of the elements as the balloon itself. Award-winning adventure filmmaker Sid Peru will hang in space, suspended on a rope from the neck of the balloon, several hundred empty feet above the rocky landscape below. After all the delays imposed by filmmaking, the liftoff itself suddenly imposes its own speed. I had a fascination for the hot air balloons. And he said, well, I said, well, how do you get your best shots? And he said, well, the best ones, he said, I hang a camera out from the crown line. So it's about 10 or 15 feet out from the basket. So I get the basket against the landscape. And I pondered this for a while. I said to him, you don't think you could hang a cameraman out there, do you? And he said, well, I don't know, you know. Um, he said, you'd have to ask the manufacturers. Well, we asked the manufacturers and um, the manufacturer said, well, we don't know, but um, I don't see why not. The, the technique was that the line came from the outside of the balloon, hung down below the basket and then up in a loop back to the basket. And I've made a sort of little metal platform that walked over the side. And um, basically I'd start off on the outside, get lifted off on the outside. Then before it was coming in, I'd pull in the tail rope um, I'd drop down below the basket, pull in the tail rope, do a changeover, and then plastic up that rope to the platform and then be pulled in. Because obviously they couldn't land with me hanging out there. I'd have you know, knocked a few walls down and things. <laughs> Some more walkers down there, probably wondering what on earth is going on. Look, just down there. I need to go to see that cylinder because it's my last one now. I've got okay. no pressure on the others, OK? The wind and weather is so uh, bleak up here that it's caused a tremendous effect on the stonework of this viaduct. And uh, although it was built only just over 100 years ago, uh, when most stone structures still have a lot of life left in them, this one is really wearing out and uh, the cost of replacing it is going to be so enormous that British Rail are considering whether it's cheaper to actually close the whole line, which would be a tremendous shame because it's one of the scenically most spectacular lines in Britain. Hit the pilot lights! Hit the pilot lights! Hold on! Hold on! Hold on! Hit the pilot lights, Ray, come on! Not the pilot lights, that's... Hit the pilot lights. Come on, knock them off. It's gone. OK, fine. <clears throat> Hold on tight! <laughs> now, don't fall back. I'm right behind you. Hold on tight. Hold on. Now, do not move. Don't get out. Stay in. Stay in. Good. Or well, stay in. OK. Now, don't, don't get out, anyone, yeah? Oof. OK, Ray, you can now get out, please. Yeah. Look as if you're fairly alive. OK. And at the end of the first week, um, I'm with the team um, in a new location and we follow this big stream passage, um, walk into Sarawak Chamber. Well, I, I didn't walk into Sarawak Chamber, they did, because I got halfway with the cameras and then there was a, a pool that you had to swim across and I had no way of getting the cameras across. So I had to go out. And then they came back and told these stories of this phenomenal huge chamber where they they just got lost in this black void. Like going going to Sarawak Chambers rather like um, going up Ingleborough up from Creener Bottom, only with a roof on right to the top of Ingleborough. It's that kind of scale. It's absolutely massive. And uh, at the top, we had all the natives with um, taking lights, and they were all supposed to spread out and walk across the chamber and to show the scale of the thing. But they were so scared of it that they 
they all huddle together like you know primary school football team they're all after the ball sort of thing and all together and Sid kept shouting at them now 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 spread out now spread out now spread out and then Lindsay kept saying use your walkie talkie Sid and he was going now now spread out now now spread out and then eventually he said uh, you know, can you spread out please on the um, on the walkie talkie and he kept reverting to trying to shouting across this massive chamber and it was, you couldn't hear a bloody thing at the entrance rift, the team is surprised to find the water has dropped so far as to make the use of a boat unnecessary. This makes much easier the task of transporting heavy filming equipment into the cave. As the passage climbs away from the stream, the walls recede on either side. The roof is lost in the darkness above. Ben Lyon. When you actually got there, it was just astounding. You go up the boulders and climb up and up, great holes between them, some of them as big as houses. The walls get further apart, and then they, they just disappear, and you're left on this slope going up at about 35 to 40 degrees, and it just goes on and on. The total impression was of climbing a very large, very loose mountain slope in total, utter pitch blackness. It was a very incredible experience. I almost said intimidating, but I knew what to expect because the others had told me, so I wasn't really intimidated, apart from the fact that these bloody big boulders kept crashing down. It's not the sort of place which you can really appreciate for its beauty because you really see absolutely nothing. Just a bit of floor you're on and the most intense blackness that you can ever experience. You, you don't walk around this chamber, far from it. It's tilted at such a sea bangle with all this loose stuff that it's necessary to climb very, very carefully and gingerly up and around. It takes several hours to traverse right around it. And uh, only by surveying around the perimeter of the chamber, that is um, leading out a tape measure, taking a bearing of it distance and doing that all the way around and then plotting it up afterwards, were we able to actually say what the dimensions were. And um, what was really nice about it, we, I used to, you know, I used to get so many complaints. Um, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? When you go back into the editing room, and this time, the producer and the director and the editor came out on the trip. They thought for jolly, but I needed a shop with some old miners, so I, I got some old clo clothes and dressed them up in old clothes and got them carrying scaling poles in and scaling the waterfalls. And of course it's melt water, it's freezing in there. And then having done that, we went, we climbed up the waterfall and filmed further on um, and left them sat in the bottom of this chamber under this waterfall. And they, they were huddled together under a cape absolutely were going down with exposure by the time we got back they were they were in a bad way and eventually staggered out the cave and the words i always remember said um, i'll never complain about about your rushes again said peru <laughs> we had with us five pieces of iron pipe each was a little over six feet long they could be screwed hand to hand forming a long rod Précaution, messieurs, les cristallisations sont fragiles. The icy damp pour sought me through in a twinkling and hammered savagely at my back and shoulders. I could not even climb so fast as I would have liked because I had to keep an eye on the balance of the pipe which threatened to slide off. Beautiful as these formations are, it is cameraman Sid Peru's lifelong ambition to film those in the fabled seventh heaven, the most secret chamber of all. Camera? Yeah. Okay, okay. Right there. Batteries? Oh, it's a bit. Right, let's try your light on, Curti. Uh, can you hold it up a bit higher? A bit closer? That's it. Nice. Now your light, John Gibb. 
Beautiful. Right, okay. Right, running. On to Shelley. We started filming in the entrance passage to Seventh Heaven. That was already very beautiful. But before we were allowed to enter Seventh Heaven itself, we were going to have to take off our boots and all our muddy overgarments, even our helmets, to minimise the damage that we could cause. This is one of the few places I know of where there are the three basic crystals of aragonite, gypsum and calcite all together on the one formation plus many other minerals which are introduced in various odd forms so you get an infinite variety of shapes and the appearance is almost like snow crystals rather than rock formations You know, it looked like the whole thing wasn't looking good until we went down in the valley and explored a rising. And Dave Gill discovered this short duck through. Um, that led to a fine piece of stream cave and, and, and you know, quite a decent resurgence cave called Vestercock. Gail Searby explains. Vestercock was the most unusual cave with the very small entrance, then just down below the entrance was the lake. What does it look like around there? Not too good, actually. We really weren't at all excited when we went in there. We just thought we'd have a swim around the lake. It didn't seem possible that there could be a cave on the other side. Hold on. Yeah, there seems to be an airspace on the other side. I'll have a duck through and have a look, OK? OK. <sighs> I'll just be right in line. Go ahead, Dave. Come on through. It's Looks like this. he's going, Gail. Okay, just a second. Oh, oh wow, it's really big. Yeah, it looks it. Great. We were incredibly excited when we first got through and we started wandering along the really big passageway right at the very beginning. Woo! Hey, it's a good echo. I was trying to control my excitement so that I wouldn't be disappointed later on, you know, all the way through the trip so far up in San Cristobal. Every cave would be a disappointment. And I kept thinking, well, this is the one, it's really going to go. And I didn't dare say too much because I kept thinking, well, what if it doesn't? With the help of the Presidente, a house is found to accommodate the team at the nominal rent of 10 pounds or 15 US dollars per month. Who was it after the um, earthquake here? That was uh, Bester Cop, wasn't it? Yeah, I, just before Sid went, went sick on the trip, I guess. Uh, we were staying in a uh, house in, uh, in a small village in Mexico. Um, Sleeping on the floor. There was about 20 of us and a housemate of three people. Uh, usual caving thing. Sid uh, put his hammock up between two uh, two of the. I'm sorry, put it on the veranda. On the, on the veranda, yeah, between two of the columns. Uh, John Thorpe, lugger, had decided to sleep underneath Sid on the veranda. Uh, halfway through the night, we had an earthquake. All woken by Terry Whitaker shouting, we've got to get out of the house, we've got to get out of the house. Um, all John Thorpe said is he woke up and the house was shaking and he looked up and thought, oh, Sid's having a wank, <laughs> and went back to sleep. <laughs> One feature of life in Mexico that everyone enjoys is traditional Mexican hospitality. On Christmas Eve, the team is initiated into the subtle rites of tequila and mezcal by local caver and photographer Vicente Kramsky. <laughs> later, on in, later on in the evening, of course, alcohol took over and um, all the hats did it eventually end up on Sid's head and there is a photograph somewhere of him with all the uh, little pointed hats all over his face, his head and round his neck. 
um, in the in Dracos. I remember very innovative, Sid, and uh, I remember being at the back of the, the hotel Marnie in, uh, in in Dracos when we were all trying to avoid the uh, the landlady's daughter, and Sid was there and had to make conversation with her quite a lot of the time, and whilst at the same time trying to make about four or five one thousand watt lights out of old saucepans, and uh, and being very successful as well. Well, that was Sid all over, really, very innovative and uh, um, incredibly hard working. And, you know, and he got the results in the end, which, which, which was great, despite all the mishaps on route. But uh, it, was, it, it was great fun working with him. Um, but there's a limit uh, that you can take. And um, uh, I guess I'd had mine after a few years. As he got further into the sump, the passage got larger and larger, and as soon as he turned on the 1,000-watt filming lights, he saw a scene that really nobody had seen before. The passage was laid out in, in minute detail in front of you. In places, there was a perfect layering effect of the, the water. To the diver behind, it looked as though you were skimming across the surface of a lake, sometimes dipping into it and sometimes coming out again. Except, of course, all the time you were 20 metres below the water surface. They were in the harbour and they were, uh, they'd met this bloody great camera housing. I mean, it was massive. It was like, it was like a milk churn. Just all the little camera. And anyway, they, him and Gay were trying to get to the idea of diving and going down with it and adjusting buoyancy and stuff. And, as soon as Sid set off, he just got hold of it. It was just like a deck charge going down with him, and down he went, and no idea how to clear his ears or anything. And as he went down and sort of was getting some pain by it, he'd he come shooting up and gear and have a go, and then down a bit further, and they, they, they were just like passing each other with, uh, with their ears popping and pressure on their ears, and uh, it was absolutely hilarious. And then, then there were a big wave, a big tide, like a big tide came in and it said and pushed him onto rocks and there were a big spiny army sea urchin there and got hold of it with his hands and it was just absolutely full of pull of little needles in his hands and everybody were laughing you know and said <laughs> 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 and I wanted to do something in this country and and the otter story was a, an incredible one that hadn't happened that long at that time and I'd seen the photographs and thought I'd love to get in and film that and got in touch with the Gloucester and various people and, and we got a team together to do it. Eventually, the passage brought them to a muddy incline and the seeming conclusion of their exploration. Then we moved away a few boulders and there was a black space beyond. Immediately we scrabbled through and suddenly the cave got a whole lot bigger and formations started appearing and the further we went along this huge passage, the formations got better and better. As we got to this corner where the passage grew perhaps 30 feet wide and 20 feet high, the formations were huge. We were red-faced and literally hoarse from the excitement of shouting, and six of us galloped down this passage before we got to some even more incredible formations. They were certainly then the best we'd ever seen in Britain, a forest of huge stalagmites leading upwards towards a ceiling where other stalagmites hang down. The minute we walked into it, we realised that there was nothing like it in the country. It was a unique cavern. It's something cavers dream about, and many cavers spend hours and hours digging and never getting anywhere, getting disappointed, giving up, and just now and again you have a major discovery. 
and these are so few and far between, especially in the British Isles. It's really something if you're the person involved. Then the one thing that the trip revolved around, of course, was that we needed to charge up the filming lights and we needed to charge the caving batteries. And Sid had built a transfer, a charging unit, which consisted of a fairly significant transformer inside a metal ammo box. And so we thought, right, time to get some batteries charged up. And he got out all the crocodile clips and set it all up and switched it on. And the lights went out because there was obviously a major problem with this transformer. He opened up the box and instead of the transformer being sat there nicely sort of secured, it wasn't nicely secured. It, it had been floating around in this box the whole journey really into the cave. A lot of the insulation had been knocked off the windings and because it was just a dead short. And so we were looking at really a disaster because without filming lights, without batteries, we're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do anything. We're gonna have to go out the cave. But uh, Sid, in, you know, really sort of almost brushed it aside and said, well, it's not a problem, I'll repair it. And to repair it involved taking the transformer apart. So he undid the windings and stretched them out along the cave passage. And then rewound it all and everywhere a little tiny piece of the winding had been chipped. He slipped a little tiny piece of insulation tape in so that it wasn't shorting out against the next one. And uh, he completely rewound the two coils for the transformer. And then we sort of sat around in, in sort of uh, with our fingers crossed when he connected everything up again and we he flicked the switch and the lights didn't go out and more importantly the charging facility started working and so the whole trip was was back on again just arrived at the camp pretty tired and uh we're gonna have a bite to eat and then be bedding down for the night and we'll while they shed wet there. and dirty caving kit for the welcome warmth of dry clothes one of the tasks of the surface crew is to ensure that the generator at the entrance keeps going. From there, a power line to the underground camp enables both the explorers and the film crew to keep their headlamps and lighting batteries charged. So eventually I'm in Mexico and it was 13 years after the original Gaping Gill film, that long. And um, I got this message in Mexico that the breakthrough had been made um, by, from Jeff Eden and Jeff Crosley and that actually they, the way was virtually open. What they'd actually done was pass the Wellington boot through apparently and then decided to leave it because it was such a historic occasion they wanted it on film. We got to the set off towards uh, um, Ingleborough Cave and Radagast Revenge um, well, don't, there don't seem to be very many people to carry the equipment, you know, Sid said. So uh, we looked round and, you know, asked for a few more volunteers. And in the end, we got about as far as Mud and Water Crawl. And there was a couple of 14-year-old boys following us with boxes and we had to send them back. Because I don't <laughs> think they would have survived. And this, this horrible journey then continued right through Mud and Water, up the Iron Ladder, down into Southgate. The airspace dwindles, three inches, then two, then one. Then hold your breath for the south gate duck. And we get to the, we're doing bits of filming on the way. And we get to the, the connection and it's inside a boulder choke, which is quite a lot of drips of water coming through. And there's like three or four of us cramped up in this boulder choke and Sid's trying to get the actual connection shot as we go through. And every time he opens the camera up, he, he opens the back up, gets the filming, and spools it all up, and just about shut the door of the camera, and a little drip of water goes in, he goes, he 
you know, bugger, you know, bugger me. So, out, door opened again, film redone, all sorts of stuff. You know, just about shut the door again, another drip of water. And this happens about four times. At the, <laughs> at the end of the fourth time, he goes on. He, he like, he exploded with rage, which, uh, you know, isn't very, it's not very often that Sid kind of gets annoyed about stuff, really, or he, he didn't. And, and he just said, oh, I don't think it's going to be feasible. And uh, there's all these people who are already going down with exposure and stuff. And, uh, uh, and there's this silence for a minute. And then uh, Je Jeff Eden broke the silence and he just said, Sid, it'll have to be. Um, we're just at the dig now and uh, wonder if your reading is OK. Over. OK, Jeff, loud and clear. Uh, what's the situation? Over. Um, well, the moment we've got Jeff Eden in the dig, He's just trying to lower the water level slightly so that we can uh, have a look see what the situation with the rocks is like. Um, it looks as though there's only one or two to move, so hopefully we should be able to get through in quite a short time. You know, right, they can come through now since so they're waiting to, for them to arrive and all this kind of thing. He says, um, right, um, run, run film, uh, run sound. Um, they're coming down and says, run sound, run sound. And then the next thing we could hear was, which was Chris Gibbon falling fast asleep. <laughs> this is, Chris, this is now good, this is now good. You, 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 you've got to be awake to do this sort of job. Anyway, they had to go back into the sump and Chris managed to stay awake to see him coming up. Oh, they're coming now, yeah. line switching. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Great, long well, last. He's going to get a shock to see us here. Well, they're expecting us really, aren't they? Ah, oh, it's Julian. Oh. Jimmy Iron. What's the visibility yeah, like? What's the visibility poor. like in pretty poor? Pretty poor. Yeah, that dig is absolutely yeah. obnoxious now. It's really filthy. It's really filthy. Here we go. Alright. See you on the surface. Yeah, here we go. Take care. Normally you quite reluctant to get uh, cold and submerged, but on this occasion it was a great relief to finally don our air cylinders and dip our heads beneath the water. I, uh, Jeff and me put on the diving gear that uh, Jim and Julian had uh, swum through with and, uh, and as soon as we went underwater, this, it was, it was like, we felt like prisoners escaping from a, a jail, you know, we'd been condemned to Sid for so many hours and we could escape. Um, as we got up to the, to the far end of the six or seven hundred foot of sump through to Inglebury Cave, we, the first thing that happened when the mouthpieces dropped out, we both burst into laughter, thinking what horrors we'd left Jim and Julian with. You know, we've got Sid there virtually, you know, needing rescuing. Well, you know, and a team that needed to, they, they rescued themselves and it took them about, I think, 15 or 16 hours to get out. And it was a, a major job, whereas we just cruised out of Inglebrook here with the Bradford team carrying us and singing, what was it, uh, Jerusalem, the tops of our voices. <laughs> And they went out to Jordan and took um, microlites for the, and hang gliders for the first time into Jordan. And King Hussein, who was very keen on flying, was involved. And um, it, it was uh, great, except that Yasmin, which was the girl's name, developed a cough. And when she came back, it turned out to be lung cancer. And she was, I forget, 23, I think, something. And, and, and she, she was dead within months. A week in and over 2,000 kilometres behind them, the weather has finally broken. Flying above the beautiful valleys of Romania is pure pleasure. 
These aircraft have a two-cylinder, two-stroke engine with a capacity of 462 cc, about the size of an average motorbike engine. Engine failures are not unknown, but the aircraft's ability to glide usually makes it possible to find an emergency landing site. However, in some types of terrain, the options can be almost zero, and ahead lies just such a section. The following day, they must cross the Carpathian Mountains, the highest peaks in Romania. Okay, off we go, and off we go. Golf Mike Yankee Bravo Whiskey is now two miles west of runway at 1,000 feet QNH 1014 and holding. Okay, confirm flying only one aircraft or uh, two aircraft? Uh, we are two aircraft. Well, we've been told to hold our position uh, two kilometres from the runway at a thousand feet, so we're actually orbiting in a holding pattern. He's got us in sight, so there's two aircraft to land on this runway before us, and then we'll be cleared to land. I've done this in a 747, but I've never done it in a microlight before. The only places they have official permission to land are Istanbul and Ankara. But what seems to escape the authorities is that their range without refueling is half of that distance. Fortunately, they can carry the necessary fuel in panniers. Put it down, babe. There she goes. But Yasmin has the last joke. Judy's throttle is about to stick open one more time. Golf Bravo Whiskey taxiing to keep out of way of Golf Papa Victor. The key to cave diving was Martin Fry's book. Um, but it rang a bell to me because I had known cave divers, you know, for quite a lot of years. And I'd seen the developments come, and I'd seen the improvements come in the technique, and I'd seen people die along the way. And I thought it was an incredible story that, that was going on in this country under people's noses, and they didn't know what was happening. The engineer in Balkan came to disdain such crude solutions. He and Shepard spent the ensuing months solving some of the problems they had experienced by mechanical means. They must have pumped air, telephone communications with a support party, and most dramatically of all, a diving dress to contain the air supply and keep out the cold. In this suit, on October the 4th, 1936, Shepard made his attempt on Sump 1. Pumping. Any sound yet, Jumbo? That's going. Can't hear. Okay. All right. Okay. Say again. Keep pumping. I'm screaming. The water disappears into a pool at the bottom of the Bergen and it comes out at the caves of Saf Sassenage uh, about a mile and a half away and um, a few hundred feet deeper. So we knew there was a potential to make the cave even deeper if we could get through the siphon. So I went in on a, a heavy line, a caving line, in case the 
river went to a narrow passage, in which case there'd be a heavy current, which I wouldn't be able to swim against, and the people who were paying out the line could have pulled me back if necessary. A world record, an achievement of such enterprise and courage, could not have come at a better time for the sport. It was as though the whole game had been lifted to a new level. Cave diving, to its secret delight, was news. The missing Eastgill water is now found deep underground, running in an impressive canyon. Following it downstream, a large, dark and forbidding sump pool stops progress. In March 1964, Boone, Clegg and a support party which included Clegg's wife Dorothy had decided to look at the sump. Boone elected to dive first. The Lancaster Hall sump is an enormous sump. I don't know if there's any, any bigger in the Dales. Instead of diving from the start of the sump, I thought I would save doing this by floating in a rubber tube uh, to the end of the sump and then diving vertically from it. Uh, now bear in mind that all this is without fins. Fins really um, weren't in use for cave diving at this point. I tied my diving line to the tube uh, and then I paddled out the tube to the end and then I dived into it. Clegg now entered the water to take over operations. As his wife Dorothy looked on anxiously, he disappeared into the menacing darkness of the sump. At first, all seemed to go normally, but then there were indications that Clegg was having difficulties. I just sort of adopted a wait and see approach and then there was a, a sort of big cloud of bubbles came up and I, I then knew the mouthpiece was out of his mouth and I dived into him. far from shore and he seemed to be in some kind of a slot and I grabbed hold of him around the body and gave a terrific pull underwater and shifted him about a few inches and I then shot out on the on the line that had been washed in and said pull like hell or something like that and we pulled uh, and out he came like a cork from a bottle but of course was drowned and then the pressures were such that I eventually did a dive in Bowen, which I wasn't really ready to do. But I felt I was the only one that could go through and film the stuff uh, beyond the dives. And I had no training hardly. And I, I, on the way back, completely screwed up and came with a hair's breadth of dying. You know, I'd lost both my valves and I was laying there and going unconscious in the sump. And it was Watto that saved my life. And as I went round the bedding, all I could see was these fins motionless in the passage and went a bit further for Sid. And I got up to Sid and he's there with his valve out of his mouth and just shaking his head and just totally, that's all he was moving, just his head just swaying from side to side. The line twisted around his cylinders and uh, I thought, oh no, Sid, you can't die on me. So I um, went up to him and I managed to get his valve back in his mouth and um, shook him a bit and it still wouldn't, still kept spitting it out. So it was a case of ramming it into his mouth at this point and pressing the purge button and getting some air into him. Uh, and on that it started to calm down a bit, well, so I thought.
I mean, the, the, you know, obviously it's it's nice to have an Emmy, but um, really the film I, it came from, you know, I was not that knocked out by it. It wasn't the story that they should have told. And it was for National Geographic, down Ledger Gear. But having said that, just the opportunity of going down Ledger Gear, and I've, I've been down twice filming, and going down there with filming lights and lighting that place up and seeing it with, with such light is absolutely sensational. And that's worth a lot more than an Emmy. Knowing how successful he like, knowing how good he is at organising things and how forgetful, he'll, he'll end up in <laughs> Thailand and his furniture will end up in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sid, it, my experience working with you has been an absolute pleasure and I really sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, wish you a fantastic future in a lovely, warm, tropical environment. Yeah, I'm, I'm very envious. I just wish... I could up sticks and w move somewhere warm myself. So good on you. You've done the caving world a massive service. And uh, yeah, you'll be held in high esteem by all of us. Thank you, Sid. Well, yeah, well, happy retirement, Sid, and here's to it. Cheers. Yeah, for all I said about you, Sid, you're always a good mate and had an awful lot of laughs with you. So long and happy retirement. Cheers. But um, if he's uh, going to Bangkok or wherever it is, I mean, it was. Uh, it deserves a really long and happy retirement, and uh, I, I wish you all the best, Sid. So cheers, Sid. I'll uh, I'll be coming to see you in Thailand. <laughs> Skype to Skype costs nothing whatsoever. So please, please keep in touch and keep us up to date with your latest exploits. I'm sure you're going to find some caves out there, amongst a number of other things. So best wishes. See you soon, mate. Well, Sid. You've put me to some fair places and we've seen some fair things, but uh, I'm glad I can see you actually going now. It's going to be great knowing that when that phone rings, it won't be you ringing up wanting me to do something for you again. Well, all the best in your new life then, Sid. You know, you've uh, managed to make uh, our lives, enrich our lives considerably, but also you, you, we had a fair bit of misery to put up with, but I think you had even more to put up with. The main thing you must advise you to do is never go down a cave again with a, a camera. Yeah, you know, was, uh, some of his favourite sayings is, uh, well, I don't think it's going to be feasible, but we'll give it a go. And, uh, well, uh, well uh, I appear to have uh, run out of film. Well, uh, well uh, uh, the battery's flat. No, 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 no,